Bob Johnson, Senior Vice President of Hannah Armstrong, and a welcome to panel number three, Scaling It Up. You know, we debated a little bit about the title of the, uh, the panel. We talked about just get her done, or uh, just do it, or where the rubber meets the road, but all those were really taken, so it's, it's scale it up at this point. And we're going to talk about the local law 97 as it relates to three specific areas. Uh, first is the uh, quality control, so we have to do all these retrofits. How are we going to maintain quality control? The second is cost effectiveness. What is the cost effect effectiveness of what we're doing? And third is, um, is around speed of execution. How do you get this done in the time frames that have been, been talked about? The panel here is going to uh, talk about a, um, uh, give brief presentations, and then we're going to have a Q&A session and then an audience Q&A. So we're pretty interactive. I want to get as many questions in as possible because that's where I think the learning actually occurs. Joining me here with the panel are... Uh, Sabrina Canner. Sabrina is with um, Brookfield, and she's the executive vice president there. Uh, we have Dan Friend with Noresco. Dan is the regional vice president or v regional sales manager with uh, Noresco. Well, I'll take vice president. I, I just gave you a, a promotion there. Uh, <laughs> Rich Benkowski, he is a training specialist for the United Association of Plumbers and Pipefitters. And uh, Kelly Doherty, she's, uh, she's the director of energy management for uh, First Service um, uh, Residential. So it's a pleasure, pleasure to have all of the, uh, the members here of the panel with me. Um, we're going to go through a couple of um, slides here. I'll start out with the slides. Um, I want to keep it very brief since we're behind time. But one of the things I want to do is, this is a slide about Hannah Armstrong, and the first question I have is, how many people here have heard of Hannah Armstrong? Our marketing is working. Well, thank you very much. Um, you can see about who we are. We're the first public company to be fo solely focused on um, financing uh, climate change solutions. But what I want to turn your attention to specifically is the box on the left. We've heard at least five or six times today, at least I have, um, the word energy efficiency. And energy efficiency, in my mind, doesn't really tell the whole story. What we're doing is reframing this discussion around what we called behind the meter. So when we heard Tom talk about his uh, projects, all of his projects were really behind the meter projects. They were talking about lighting, water conservation, cogeneration, solar. We didn't talk about battery because Tom hasn't done it yet, but all those things that, that you're talking about are all behind the meter, whether they be energy using equipment or energy producing equipment. They all are behind the meter. So we're reframing, free, reframing our discussion around the behind the meter. In fact, I'm leaving here uh, tomorrow to go to a ribbon cutting for a microgrid. It's about an $85 million project. It includes a 3.5 million dollar, 3.5 megawatt cogeneration plant, a 6 megawatt solar plant, and an 8.5 megawatt hour uh, uh, battery uh, wall by Tesla in addition to 29,000 LED lights. So it is much like Tom's project, except it's one single project trying to do a, a microgrid. So I want to reframe everybody's thought process around this whole idea of behind the meter, not just energy efficiency. Why are we here? We all know why we're here. <clears throat> Talk for one minute about um, this idea of um, behind the meter. A few years ago, we started out looking at what's the uh, CO2 um, mitigation for every $1,000 of investment, since we are a banking uh, investment organization, we wanted to find this out. And what we discovered was rather interesting is that the things that make up this behind the meter called energy efficiency and cogen, they happen to be the most efficient ways to spend your money to reduce carbon. That's a rather interesting place to be because now it proves what we're doing is really the right thing to do, notwithstanding the question before about cogeneration. So I want to point this out because it's rather interesting. This has morphed into something we call a carbon count now. So we actually um, take each one of the projects we do every year and we enumerate the exact carbon benefit of each of the projects. It varies by uh, location around the uh, nation. As you can well imagine, if I did this for uh, Kentucky, for example, a lot of the uh, power there is produced by coal plants. If I do it in California, this carbon count would be much less because the electricity is produced by mainly natural gas in California. So this varies by region of the country, but nonetheless, the, the, um, the, the basics of how this works is exactly the same. And finally, there's lots of ways to get this done. Clay pointed out um, performance contracting, for example. Um, to give you an idea, we financed a, and Clay also, thank you, mentioned uh, D.C. and the federal government being uh, exempt from the D.C. Uh, law. But what I want to point out is that the federal government is actually doing a lot of things. Here in New York, we financed a project that was approximately $120 million for 10 buildings that the GSA owns here in New York City. So those have been retrofitted and the, and the project is completed. So the federal government is actually doing things uh, right here in your backyard. 
Um, the other thing I want to point out, we'll talk about this uh, later, are things like uh, PACE, Property Assessed Clean Energy, that's now part of the Local Law 97, as well as um, energy savings uh, agreements and the like. There are lots of ways to get done what we need to get done from a structure standpoint. Uh, it's now just a matter of, um, of, of doing it at this stage. With that, I'm going to turn it over to, there we go, Sabrina. Thank you, Sabrina. Good morning. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Sabrina Kanner, Executive Vice President of Design and Construction for Brookfield Properties. In New York City alone, Brookfield owns 5,500 multifamily apartments with 3,600 more under development and 29 million rentable square feet of commercial office property. Clearly, the impact of the building emissions law is profound to us, um, among many other real estate owners because of the sheer scale of the scope. How effective is renovation in reducing energy consumption? A few years ago, we at Brookfield renovated an existing building, not to comply with energy codes or new statutes, but for the usual garden variety reasons, a real estate developer redevelops a building. I'd like to share that project with you, as well as the surprising results of that renovation. We're looking at 450 West 33rd Street, arguably the ugliest property in New York City. <laughs> Prior to owning this beauty, Brookfield's design and construction team loved to hate it. Um, it's brutalistic. Um, we often called it the elephant's foot. <laughs> to my surprise, one Monday morning in end of 2012, Rick Clark, our chairman, called to say that he had actually purchased this building over the weekend. Rick said, see what you can do with it. <laughs> We conducted a design competition, and the overwhelming favorite was Rex's vision for the building, including a new and, in many ways, innovative facade design. Fast forward, we're looking at the building today. We have reskinned the building, installed six ad additional elevators. It was originally built as a, as a warehouse, refurbished and added new mechanical equipment to the existing systems, including controls and BMS performed some structural surgery to produce a new ADA-compliant lobby. And the reasons for renovating were commercially driven. The existing concrete facade was literally spalling off the building into the street, creating a safety hazard. The windows were not at eye level on every floor, and the building was leasing at B-minus rents. To truly appreciate the jump in quality of comfort and vision afforded by this transformation, you must understand how horrific the existing facade was. <laughs> Glazed area for the existing facade was 27% of the wall versus 74% transparent vision glass provided in the new facade. While shifting from a largely solid facade to all glass, the new wall, in fact, provided an 80% improvement in energy efficiency in the spandrel. The U factor went from 0.41 to 0.071, and a 70% improvement from the existing vision glass to the new vision glass, a U factor of 1.25 improved to 0.38. The geometry of the curtain wall also enhanced the energy efficiency of the facade. Rex had designed the pleats so that the overslung top reflected solar energy away and provided solar shading to the underslung plane. Whoops. Am I there? Underslung plane and interior space. The increase in daylight provided a pleasing and healthy space, resulting in vastly improved leasing activity, rents, and value. We measured the energy consumption of five Manhattan West before and after our renovation and were startled at the dramatic results. Electrical power consumption is down from a peak 2.4 million kilowatt hours in the July before replacing the curtain wall to 1.3 million kilowatt hours in July after replacing the curtain wall, or a 46% decrease in consumption. And Steam consumption is down from approximately 6,000 kilopounds per month in winter before renovating to about 2,500 kilopounds in the winter post-renovation, or an incredible 58% decrease. There's no doubt, there's a very compelling environmental argument for renovating aging buildings. When you consider that this renovation was not designed 
for renovate for to specifically focus on energy efficiency, the potential of what can be achieved when energy efficiency is targeted is extraordinarily exciting. As an industry, we are fixated on the enormity of the scope and cost of compliance with the building emissions law, and understandably so. But real estate fundamentals suggest that we not lose sight of the power of creativity. Innovational renovation can also drive an important increase in value, very possibly the hidden upside in the building emissions law. A critical part of our approach must be identifying this value and hopefully monetizing it to support compliance moving forward. Thank you. Good morning. Um, thank you for allowing me to be here this morning. Clay did a nice job of teeing up Fiesco World for us here today. I know there's probably a lot of questions around that. Uh, the good news is Ellen has asked me to give a brief overview, so I'm going to do my best to keep it as brief as I can. I only have a few slides. I promise it'll be quick. Um, so before I get into that, one of the things I would like to ask is who here has been involved in an actual performance contract or is at least familiar with the concept? <clears throat> wow. Quite a few more than I thought, so maybe I could just get off the stage now. <laughs> um, what is energy performance contracting? For those of you who don't know, it's really it's, it's an ability uh, to use a contracting vehicle to upgrade infrastructure uh, by leveraging utility and operational cost savings. So it's not, it's not a, a one-size-fits-all, but when it works, it works fantastic. So what can you do by doing a performance contract? You can actually install what we call traditional energy conservation measures. You can install water conservation measures. Sometimes you can do renewable technologies if it makes sense. You can address sustainability goals throughout this program. Um, and most of all, you could probably tackle a lot of deferred maintenance uh, issues as well. The nice thing about this is that you can actually do it at no, without fighting for those capital dollars. Really no out of capital cost is required in this sort of a program. You're actually already paying for this program already and you just don't know it. And I'll describe that in a minute. From a program standpoint, one of the things that we really try to accomplish when we set these up is that after all costs are considered, we try to make sure that you have a positive cash flow at the bottom line each and every single year of the term. Uh, of the contract, and a, and a contract typically can run on average somewhere between 10 and 20 years, depending on your situation. And to wrap that all in a nice bow, the ESCO, generally speaking, will put a uh, guarantee on the performance of the key indicators. So uh, it's a great win-win. It's an ability to take the risk off the owner and put it on to the ESCO. <clears throat> what I'd like to do now is actually show you what graphically this looks like from a financial standpoint. If you look at the blue bar, you'll see that really represents your energy and operational budget today, or your cost today. And if you do nothing, that's what you're going to continue to pay. If you do something and you were to enter into a performance contract, and if it makes sense for you, you move to the middle bar. After installation of energy conservation measures, you should see a reduction in that cost. And then on top of that, you will now have for the lack of a better term, a mortgage payment, if you will, uh, on the stuff that you install. And then what's left is the positive cash flow that we kind of talked about. On the, all the way to your left-hand side, you'll see this really represents what happens when the term of the contract is complete. So when we go away, the net benefit really falls to you, the owner, um, in droves, which is really kind of nice. I know many of the people in the room here have quite a task in front of you and quite a challenge in front of you to renovate and make your buildings more efficient and finding a way to make that happen. Um, and I'm guessing most of the people in the room here have uh, a large portfolio of buildings that you're trying to figure out what to do with. Well, there's really a couple of different approaches that you can take. Both have their, their call it pros and their cons, depending on what's important to you. Well, first approach really is the, if you want to call it, phased approach. And this might be most ideal in this sort of situation when we're trying to figure out labor needs and, and different approaches to get things going. Um, this is a smaller subset of buildings that you would typically take on. You would be able to get to a contract quicker because your development time would be shorter and your cost of 
the overall program would be less, so you would have to go out for less funding. So those are all great things. And you can learn along the way and take those best practices, if you will, onto the next phases, which is great. The downside of a phase approach really is that you don't get the net benefit of all those improvements right out of the gate. So you might have to wait till the end of the, the final phase, which in some cases might mean you start over again and, and begin the whole process. So that can be a, a downfall or a disadvantage of a phased approach. All-inclusive all approach is great because you do receive the net benefit of the program right out of the gate, which is fantastic. But if you're talking a large-scale number of buildings, that can be a pretty costly venture. You're going to have to go out for a, a lot of funding for that sort of approach. The development time may take longer, and uh, you know, getting to a contract is ultimately going to take longer. The, uh, the you know, benefit of that, again, though, is that you do get the benefit of the equipment that's installed right up front and, and reap those rewards throughout you know, the following 10, 20 years or, or whatever it may be. So these are a couple different ways that we can really strategize or scale for approach on, on, on large-scale portfolio of buildings. It's, uh, it's a couple different ways that Eurasco can work with you. It's a customized approach. It's not a one-size-fits-all. This program does, does not always work in every sector of the business, but you know, as time goes on, I think we're going to have to adjust and build this business model to, to really uh, take into account some of the challenges that you have in front of you here. This is just a general quick overview. I know we're going to get into some questions further. Uh, it's a much deeper thing than what I've gone over here <laughs> in just a few minutes, but uh, thank you for your time. All right, uh, good morning, and uh, we want to thank uh, Urban Green Council for inviting us today. And, you know, it's not a party till the hook and ladder shows up, let me tell you. That's exciting. For I already sent a picture to my kids. I said, you know what, I got a true New York experience today. It was exciting, it was fun, and, and we're getting a lot of business accomplished. So um, when we talk about scaling it up, and this is just going to be one example. I work for the International Training Fund of the United Association, uh, we're part of the North American Building Trades uh, Association and unions, and the, the thing here is this, this is not about being organized or unorganized. This is about having a structure in place that can offer a deliverable manpower that can be cost effective, you know, reliable, repeatable. You know, some, the, the good, fast, and cheap, you know, discussion that happens in construction all the time, you know, sometimes may not represent the whole picture of construction. You know, good, fast, and cheap may be goals, but, you know, you also have to look at safe and productive. And if you add those two things into the equation, then basically you're looking at, you know, organizations that have cultural commitments for those goals. And they're common goals. You know, the developers, the building owners, everybody in this room has common goals for those outcomes on construction projects, beside good, fast, and cheap, you want it to be safe and productive. Productive, of course, to be in under budget, but safe so that it reduces the liability of the people that build the building and also make sure that things are designed in for the, for the occupants. Uh, one of the things that uh, we're very proud of in our, in our organization is that we can be very nimble and and very flexible. And by, by that I mean that there are going to be challenges that are brought up as things evolve, as this is evolving here, the challenges are going to show up that we need to respond to. So our partner, uh, Urban Green, we've worked for many years on the green professional trades training and on both the plumbing and the mechanical trades to learn how to, how to work sustainably. It's kind of like how to learn to work safely. There's a behavior modification and how to work in a sustainable fashion is going to be another behavior mo modification where you understand the language, understand the vocabulary, so that our workforce can walk into a conversation like this at any level and know the difference. Simple things, like if you're in a, in a LEED certified building and you pull the filters out, you know that there's a MERV rating you, you need to get to. You just don't go by the same two-inch or four-inch filter. So things like that that, that become embedded 
in the training that allow the culture to grow uh, for those goals. Lean construction, we're going to check that box too. Lean construction is about efficiency, it's about productivity, and our members on our forum and especially understand that and get that type of training. We work with, with many partners. Uh, Carry Universe, I just, this logo didn't show up just because they're the sponsor today. This logo shows up in every discussion we have about it because they're very valuable partners and we'll talk about other partners uh, we have moving forward. We have academic partners, Ohio State, Michigan State, uh, Ferris State, uh, Eastern Michigan University that help us academically set the tone for our training. And of course there's legislative response. In California, Title 24 is about performance. And we have to look at performance as an adjunct function to the rest of the job. When you in, in, in build, a, build, build a high performance building, install high performance equipment, do the startup, do the test and balance, do the commissioning, now you have an adjunct function. You're gonna measure the performance. So Title 24 is tied to the occupancy of the building. When a permit is pulled for a building, whether it's a new or a retrofit building, Title 24 makes sure that the building inspector has, inspector has documentation that if that mechanical system was to run at a certain energy rating, it's proven. Does that make sense? Have you heard of that before? That you prove it on the day you leave, not just that it's running, not just that the pumps are flowing water, not just that compressors push a refrigerant, that the combined energy of the compressors, pumps, and fans meet the goals that it was designed for. So Title 24 went a long way. In a couple of years, we were approved as a provider because our members can now sign the documents, take the measurements, and do the work of knowing that, that when you hand the building off, that that building owner will get the energy performance that, that he was uh, promised. So the apprenticeship is in North America. We have over 300 training centers. Uh, we also have affiliations with Australia and Ireland. It gives us some access to some of the best practices and some world-class opportunities. Here in New York, we have over, in New York State, we have over a dozen locals and training centers with over 25,000 members. So there's the manpower that we're ready to offer. There's the manpower that has access to, to this type of training that we want to put into the formula of what's going to help this become a success. And we all know that, you know, technology moves faster than society because we're living it. Right? Every time we walk away from our computer or power down, the next morning we, we feel like we're behind. So we're committed to provide learning, not just to these apprentices, not just to help them earn credits, not just for the 10,000 hours of on the job, but we're committed for 35 to 40 years. These young people are coming to us for a career, and we need to help them be relevant for that career. The best example would be the, the uh, variable flow systems by Mitsubishi Daikin, Fujitsu Carrier, Johnson, these systems weren't around 10 years ago. So I wasn't trained on them, but I, our journeymen have access to that training because it helps them stay relevant and keeps them in the truck and, and doing more work. To train everybody, we have an instructor training program that takes place every year in Michigan. Our instructors, to, uh, to, to be an instructor in our system, you receive 200 hours of, of training. 100 hours of that is on how to, how to teach. So we take journeymen out of the field who have very good skills, very good hands-on skills. They can teach, they can demonstrate, but then we teach them to build lesson plans, outcomes, objectives. So that 200 hours certifies them to then participate at a high level inside their, their local training center. A couple of years ago, we went through a self-study with the Council on Occupational Education so that we can self-award credits. So we award credits to the instructors for, for participating in instructor training, some of our locals can even award credits. Now, at a few locals, the apprentices, when they graduate uh, as a journeyman, they are awarded an associate degree also on the same night. So that's a, that's a, a head start, and that, those credits are, are given at no tuition cost to the student. When I talk about the North American building trades and all the training that goes on, and this being one example, annually, North American building trade spends about a billion dollars a year in education and training. That's self-funded. That comes out of man hours worked, man hours paid, and we're, we're all very proud of the effort and the initiative, and most of all, the commitment. The commitment to offer that man hour to be safe and productive every day, no matter what the craft or the trade is. 
Another one of our many partners in industry is to help us to be good, fast, and cheap or some, some of the partners here, plus ABB Drives, plus Fluke, plus Milwaukee, and many others. But here's the thing. The, all the manufacturers, their challenge is to move energy, move thermal energy. Take that BTU, the, you know, air conditioning 101. Take heat from where it's not wanted to some place that it doesn't matter. So we take the heat out of this room, we throw it outside to where we say it doesn't matter. Now, where we put the heat and move the thermal energy matters. So compressors, pumps, and fans that move refrigerant water and air, it's very critical of how to control these. The manufacturers, though, with current compressor-based technology, we're, I, I think they're at max tech. I've heard that used by a couple of the manufacturers and a couple of the uh, uh, you know, presenters. Max tech tells us that every piece of moving equipment, the fan, the pumps, the compressors, we can vary the speed. We talked about those kind of initiatives that, you know, at Stytown, VFDs, we vary the speed with that. And that also then allows us to, to have control of it and get the most energy efficient mode for operating and comfort by, mat, by aligning the comfort levels with the operation of the system. And Nicole mentioned earlier about the, the electrifying domestic hot water. There's another place that we can very efficiently use uh, heat pumps which is just a reverse cycle air conditioner. We can use heat pumps then to move the energy where we need it, say to heat the water. The challenge there is though, that's some hybrid training. In the city, you would need what? Two licenses to work on that. If you, you need an EPA license, you need a plumber's license. Okay, that's our challenge. Challenge accepted, we've done it. Uh, in the last two years, we have trained every uh, plumbing local in the country to, to award the EPA and teach for the CFC exam. So again, being nimble and, 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 and flexible allows you to look at the challenge, meet it, use the resources you have to have an impact and get the outcome to serve the customers. And our, customer, we, our customers are our contractors, but the contractors serve the public. We need to be able to serve the public in a way that it's you know, palatable and attractive. Another partner is Ferris State that helps us, again, staying on the heat pump track to promote understanding of design selection. And uh, we are, we award cr credentials for earning these things. Another thing we do is just add ICE. That's interactive curriculum engagement. So in our system, we use technology to recruit. We use technology in the classroom. We use it on a job. Um, in, in the HVAC industry especially, there was a major disruption in 2014 when Google bought Nest. That was a big deal because Google bought Nest and, and introduced, uh, uh, introduced a, a conversation into our industry that never happened before. We're always about if that, then this. If it's 90 degrees outside, then what should it be in this room? Oh, well, let's go for 78. If, if a boiler is running at, at this temperature, what, you know, what should the room temperature be? With, with the Nest thermostat, anybody here have a Nest thermostat in their home? Okay, did you ever see the word away on your thermostat? Okay, we don't have an if then then this question for away. So Google bought it for the data. Data harvesting and monetization of that data is the next big thing for all of us. Cognitive buildings, cognitive buildings now in Europe, I think we had some discussion from the from our gentleman from NYSERDA, cognitive buildings in Europe using AI and IBM Watson are in a whole separate lane. All of the, there's, there's so many big controls manufacturers that offer us so many features and functionality on so many systems, but one thing we all have to, to start getting our head around is the connectivity of the buildings. When Chris mentioned the ecosystems, the cognitive building is gonna be having all three ecosystems talk seamlessly. You know, it's not people to people anymore. It's not people to thing, not people to my pager. It's thing to thing conversation. Thing to thing conversation is gonna, you know, drive training, it's gonna drive the jobs, it's gonna make things more efficient. So with us, we've even created a digital designer apprenticeship. So we in a partnership with AutoCAD so that we can live in the virtual world and build the real world. That's the goal. If we understand how things are connected, how things are communicated, and it's, and it's simple, for, we're not gonna write, we don't write code. Nobody's gonna write code. But we need to know, is it connected? 
is it communicated? Single digit percentage of the equipment being manufactured now is are we prepared for that of cloud-based communication? We had Jones Lang LaSalle with one of our interact with one of our large contractors, and one day they got 1,500 service tickets through the cloud. It wasn't from the building manager to the service manager, it wasn't from the building manager paging the service man. It was the rooftop unit telling the guy in the truck, get over here, I need help. So catching up to that is what we, what we all understand and what we all do. So in adding ICE, we use a lot of technology to train. We have mobile technology for training. And then let's use the lead uh, USGBC model. When you have your charrette for, st for strategic planning, include us through, through our contractor groups. We could, we'd love to sit at the table with you to plan for the outcome that you'd like. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to try to make this really brief so that we can get to um, the panel discussion that should be very interesting. So my name is Kelly Doherty. I'm the Director of Energy Management for First Service Residential um, and FS Energy. So really quickly, what is, FS Ener uh, what is First Service Residential? We are the largest um, third-party property management company for residential in North America. We operate in um, every major city and four provinces um, in Canada. Um, here in New York, we have about 530 buildings. I think that number is actually a little higher now. This slide's a little old. Um, and uh, we have about 360 metric tons of CO2 that um, we are responsible for. About 10 years ago, First Service saw that um, there was a gap between managing a building and the third party consultants that were coming in, as well as the contractors that were coming in. So they decided, we're gonna start a subsidiary business to help bridge that gap and to help our building owners make some decisions in, in um, their board meetings. Now it's important to recognize that First Service Residential has a wide variety of buildings. We have super high-end luxury buildings for condo and co-op. We have rental buildings. We have affordable housing buildings. We have walk-ups. We have um, garden style and everything that fits in between. Um, so they needed to figure out a way to help all of those buildings. Now, um, some of my colleagues have said, well, you have a really difficult job. Um, you have a board of directors for a condo and co-op that are not always um, aware of the needs of the building and maybe only thinking about the short term and not the long term. I love it because I find it a challenge and I love working with all of our buildings to try to um, get them to understand the long term strategy that they need to take for their buildings. So what do we do? So in um, the city, we provide a lot of information to our buildings. For the past 10 years, we've provided energy report cards, which benchmarks all of our buildings' um, energy use to each other. We have a significant amount of data um, and an EMIS platform where we can see how a building is using um, energy um, month to month. We also provide energy assessment reports for the building to say, you know, what are the opportunities that you can invest in um, and need to focus on. Last year, starting with Local Law 33, we gave all of our buildings their energy grade based on 2017 data to start that conversation. This year, once Local Law 97 came out, we gave everyone their greenhouse gas emissions profile to start that conversation based on 2018 data so that it was not a shock when uh, uh, we move forward. So the impact for First Service Residential, um, you know, knowing that we are as large as, as I just said, we actually replicate what the city um, expects as well for the um, the fines that are going to be associated with our buildings. So in 2024, 20% 20 of our buildings, the worst emitters, are going to have a fine associated with it. And then in 2030, um, we're looking at 77% of our buildings are going to be hit with a fine. So what do we do? Um, 
There's a lot to do, and we've been kind of, you know, talking about it for 10 years, but it has been shocking to me that even with, with providing this information to our buildings, they, not all of them have acted. We have a significant amount of buildings within our portfolio that still have an LED project. Um, they have contract, uh, contractors' proposals in front of them, and they have chosen not to move forward with it. And their ROIs are under three years. And we're just talking about one project. Now, take a step back and think about how are we going to do this huge shift of major mechanical systems if we can't even get a, a building to do an LED project that has an ROI under two years. It's a huge lift. So um, I'm, I'm very fortunate that I get to work with so many subject matter experts in the field, architects, engineers, energy service providers, the mayor's office of sustainability, the retrofit accelerator, everyone together comes together to assist in this process. We're not going to be able to do it alone. It's going to take a group effort. Um, for us, our long-term strategy is to get our buildings to think not just in the present, which is usually what happens at board meetings. What is the fire that we need to put out right now? How do we think about the future? And maybe it's that you're going to be selling your condo in a couple of years, so you're not thinking about the long term. But we need to change that and get people to think about the long term. And we're going to do it with all of these groups. We're going to do it with the owners, the property managers, the building operators, which are so crucial to this process and all of those subject matter experts as well. And one last thing that I'm going to ask, if you live in a condo or co-op, can you raise your hand in New York City? Okay. I hope that all of you push to be on the board. I need your help. <laughs> I need your help to make sure that the voice of what has to get done for the future is represented. Um, and you can do that by uh, getting on that board. So thank you very much, and we're going to go on to the panel. Thanks, Kelly. That was, uh, that was enlightening. And I don't know that I would eat at an establishment that had a grade D. So um, <laughs> I, I applaud your efforts with the, uh, the grading system there. That's, uh, that's really interesting. Now we're going to get to the uh, question and answer session. I'm sure that's something that everybody has been uh, waiting for. I want to take a, just a second here and, and uh, acknowledge the, the crowd. I'm looking at everybody, and everybody is looking at the stage, and not too many people are looking at their cell phones and iPads and the like. So this is really, really uh, uh, terrific from my perspective. That means all of you are interested. So uh, bring your questions on. We'll try to answer them along with the uh, series of questions I have. I know that I probably have too many questions to ask in the time period we have, but we'll, we'll get started here. Uh, first of all, you know, what's going to motivate building owners to do this at the end of the day? So I'm going to turn to Sabrina for just a second here. And um, you know, what are your thoughts on the carbon trading aspect of uh, the local law 97? Yeah, I can you hear me. Yes. Um, I think it's actually very exciting for someone like Brookfield, who has a, a portfolio that spans the entire city um, and the opportunity to kind of lean into an opportunity, for instance, in the South Bronx and do a little more, maybe do a lot more than we would have ordinarily done towards energy conservancy. Um, it, and the ability to trade that, possibly sell that, is very exciting. And I, I think it's a whole whole sector that we have to explore and push for um, the city to, to be open to. Um, I would very much like to also see um, averaging so that if we were able to achieve um, far more energy efficiency in some of our new developments, um, even that out over some of the older buildings in our portfolio. There's a capital nature to this, too, that, that might be fairly interesting to you. I'm representing the commercial sector. <laughs> <laughs> um, Dan, I'm going to turn to you for a second. Um, from the institutional perspective, what do you think the institutional buyers are going to see in this uh, local law, 97, as it relates to carbon trading? Well, it's a, that's an interesting question. I mean, it's, it, there's so many different products out there and different approaches that are, that are coming forward and, and things that we're trying to incorporate uh, Technologies and approaches and recs and different different things of that nature and I, I think, as you mentioned, you know, uh, the I guess 
results are yet to, uh, yet to be seen. We'll see how that all works out. But I could tell you from my perspective, from an energy performance contracting perspective, we really try to incorporate all those different facets into the overall program. So again, like you said, I'm very excited to see what that, what that means to us at the end of the day and if it can help and, and, and inspire some folks to, to be able to get moving and, and make it more economical, um, that's just a win-win. And Kelly from Multifamily? Um, so from my perspective, the carbon trading program is gonna help some of the worst emitter buildings have more time to get, um, to phase in um, their major projects that they have coming. And it also may help some of those buildings that have low, uh, very low carbon um, to make some money and to you know do some projects later on that um, maybe on the 2035 or 2040 that they're going to have to do to get to their threshold. It's going to help them get there. Interesting. Um, and just to build on the local law 97, just from a clarity standpoint, because there are some things in it that uh, still need to be clarified. For example, um, you know. As I look around, Sabrina, there's a lot of construction going on in New York City. I couldn't help but notice some of the cranes and, and things of that nature. Um, how does this affect the 2024 cap and the 2030 cap as it relates to your new construction buildings? And I'll have a follow-up on, uh, on the buildings that are in design. Okay. Um, yeah, it's interesting. i fortunate enough to work for a, what I believe is a, an environmentally responsible company. So when we model all of our buildings, existing as well as new developments, we, we do not see a hit in 2024. We're compliant. Um, 2030, we are not. As a matter of fact, the building that we're going through inspections on right now for TCO will be fined in 2030. A building that's coming out of the ground in, in foundations will be fined in 2030. Um, so I don't think we know enough. I think 2030 and how you get there is fluid enough that it's almost too early to respond, frankly. Um, but it's clearly a problem right now. I'll follow up with just one thought here. Um, it takes a while to design and finally construct a building. So if you back up from 2030 and you think about the design process and the construction process, that's going to be, what, five years maybe? So 2025, 2024 will be the, the time at which you have to start to do that for all new buildings. Would that be a fair assessment? That would be a fair assessment. Um, but I think we also, well, I would never tell someone to wait. I'm a big believer in start today. Um, we, for instance, have Cogen in the same building that I was referring to. We're going through our TCO inspections. It's gas fire turbine Cogen, and that will cost us money in 2030. So to rush in to comply with 2030 is maybe not the right answer either. I think we need another year. If you're complying in 2024, it makes sense to wait for the advisory board to do its job. Um, I have a question again for you, Sabrina. I apologize for this. Um, but you think about energy intensity and the tenants that have certain energy intensity. Um, will those folks that have energy intensity be penalized? And then on the flip side, if there's even um, tenants that aren't using their space, uh, for example, will they be rewarded? Yeah, um, it, this is one of the most interesting aspects of the law for us at the moment. Um, and I think a far more nuanced model needs to be established for the high users of the high energy users. Um, just to give you a, a framework, in, in our buildings on average, 30% uh, of the energy goes to core and shell, approximately 70% is used by tenants, and that skews far differently uh, when you have a, a big user like a trader company or, or banking 24-7 lawyers even. Um, and while we're targeting, say, 30% reduction in carbon, we are not targeting 30% reduction in revenue. So we still need all our tax base to stay viable, to stay productive, to stay um, economically afloat. Um, so I think establishing models that show what a responsible baseline might be for 24-7 or for particular 24-7 operation and then creating efficiencies around that data is probably the way to go. Mid-lease, we're, we're in a bit of trouble, frankly. Ironically, we can make improvements to a building that improve energy efficiency and pass those costs along to our tenants. If we receive a penalty, we cannot. So um, clearly, we'd be penalized 
because of the actions of a tenant, yet they would not share in that. And not that I would ever promote penalizing a, a tenant, in case any of my tenants are here. Um, um, I think it's important feedback, and so somehow we need to find positive ground to partner up with the tenants so that they are aware of what they can do in order to comply and help us comply. And, and I do believe at the, at the bottom of it, they want to comply. Sure. If I can. Um, sure. so we're actually dealing with the same problem in multifamily because a lot of our buildings have ground floor um, tenants. And I just had a conversation last week um, with one of our boards that's already proactive in deciding what they want to do. They have done a lot already. Um, and they don't have a connection to the um, retailer that's on, I'm not going to mention their name, but they're a very large pharmacy um, in the city. And <laughs> they, <laughs> well, there's a couple out there, but, um, and, you know, they have said, you know, we have this lease in place for the next 10, 15, I think 15 years, actually. What are we going to do? They are a huge emitter. They are, um, you know, they have water-cooled equipment in there. They are also using steam. They, um, they have all of their lights on all of the time. They're 24 hours. Um, so uh, in, it's interesting enough that a significant amount of the residential buildings are also going to have to deal with that. Um, in addition to that, it's also the, the apartments themselves, because we're talking about aggregate usage and, and you know, 400, 500, 600 apartments in a building, you know, by each apartment is a small amount of energy, but collectively it's a lot. So we need to make sure that we're also educating each of the unit owners, the shareholders, the, re um, the tenants in the space of what energy efficiency is to live in an energy efficiency way, really. That's actually interesting. So if we were all tenants in, in a multifamily housing and I was using a lot more energy than everybody else, would then there some, be some kind of um, uh, effect from my, uh, my peers to say, <laughs> Bob, stop using so much energy? Uh, well, Con Ed gives you on, on your bill right now, they tell you like how you are compared to another, um, to your neighbor. Um, unless you, we have the submeter data, so if you're a master metered building and then we have submeter information, we don't really have access to all of that data on um, each individual apartment. Um, hopefully that changes in the very near future so we can, if, for submetered buildings, we've seen it that we see a huge spike in some apartments and we say, oh, there's something wrong in this apartment. We need to go in here and see what's happening. Um, and then we can address it, but without the data, we can't do that. What are they growing in that apartment? No, I'm just <laughs> Uh, apologize. Uh, Dan, I, I want to think about the, um, the institutional sector for a second. Um, you know, there's been a lot of retrofits done in schools and colleges and, and the like mm -hmm. um, over time. Uh, how about the clarity around Local Law 97 as it relates to public sector buildings? Yeah, so, I, you know, I think from a public sector standpoint, that kind of fits right in with what we generally do and what the ASCO model fits. I mean, if you look at its history and if you look at the ASCOs and where they've traditionally played, it's been the mush market. It's been the municipals, universities, schools, and hospitals, and when that seems to make sense. Where we have really found a challenge is probably in the uh, residential sector or you know, in a situation where it's, it's more of a commercial setting where you have uh, tenants and so forth that are actually paying the energy uh, cost versus you know, the owner of the building paying the energy cost. So you know, from a traditional standpoint of, uh, an institutional standpoint, this is a very great approach, if you will, to probably scale and get some things done in the institutional um, side of things. Do you think it'll motivate uh, the institutional owners to, to do more faster? Boy, I sure hope so. <laughs> 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 yeah, I, you know, I certainly think, uh, you know, when you have something like this out there, you're, you're putting a challenge out there or, or a requirement out there that, um, you know, how do you get it done and what do you do and how do you approach it? And, you know, I, I, I think we're going to see if a lot of people jump into this the way we anticipate or hope they will, that you know, there's going to be some challenges and some pressures and, and so forth that uh, are outside of the concept of what makes sense from a performance contracting standpoint. But I think over time, you know, uh, labor and, and all those other outside pressures will start to come around as, as this starts, kind of starts to take off a little bit. Good. Given that for the group here, I just want to ask a group question. So what are the biggest opportunities and for whom? Any ideas? Project management. <laughs> yeah, I believe so. I, I think 
um, starting today and creating a matrix of what your opportunities are and what the costs are is the responsible way to start um, than clearly contractors. But I think uh, project management, including strong design consultant team, mm -hmm. is the first step. Interesting. Any other yeah, thoughts? Well, I, I think, too, though, there is opportunity, but it's equal to challenge. Mm -hmm. The opportunity, if you can meet the challenge, to participate in, in a high performance building or a retrofit, meeting those challenges and to support and, and, and be a part of your strategic planning and and how the, these projects unfold, then there are a lot of people, you know, when you look at the, the earlier slide of needing 141,000 new jobs, uh, the people that will be getting those jobs will be the ones that will accept that challenge mm -hmm. and be able to, to, to perform at a high level with, with the rest of the team. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, I'm going to turn to technology now. And uh, as we all know, Tesla has uh, been very successful so far. Well, one might argue the success <laughs> at this point. But it's um, been successful with packaging new technology and existing technology. I mean, after all, the wheel has been in invented. So uh, we have these new electric cars. Um, as we look at technology, and Rich, I'm going to point to you here, because you mentioned uh, the HVAC industry being at max technology uh, at this point. Can, can you elaborate on that a little bit? Well, the, uh, the max tech refers to the... Uh, to, to the mechanical side of the system, but uh, the on the IT side of the system, and sometimes when we are inviting uh, young candidates to become service technicians, we don't tell them it's really an IT career uh, because they want to work on machines and equipment. But as mentioned earlier, machines and equipment are pretty t intelligent now. They're communicating in ways that we never that hadn't anticipated before, but also that that that. Uh, uh, pushes us to include technology in the training, not just uh, turning wrenches or installing things or uh, uh, using cranes to, to set big pieces of equipment. We now have to set up the communication, and that, that helps it, that, that furthers the, up the chance for the project to come in at good, cheap, and fast. If you can pick, set, uh, you know, stay pace with the ones and zeros, I think that helps the project. Uh, the project's chances of being under budget and, and then giving the return, because it's not just the budget going in, but the return, mm -hmm. that's just as important uh, with that. So uh, when, when performance is proven, uh, everybody wins. Excellent. Um, Dan, Doresco is owned by UTC, United Technologies Corporation, who owns Carrier. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a, there's a part of this that really goes to, to your business as well. Um, if, if you look at it and from a process standpoint, is this simply replacing old with new because the new is so much more efficient, or is there any kind of uh, paradigm shift that's required here? I think it's a little bit of both, actually, and, 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 and it always has been. You know, we talked about, somebody mentioned, you know, we call it behavior modification earlier. So, uh, you know, you do, equipment replacement, it's very simple, makes sense. You know, it's just a number thing. You know, what was it using before versus what is it using now? It doesn't make sense from a payback standpoint, financial standpoint, return on investment standpoint, but behavior modification and awareness is also a big component of that. Mm -hmm. You know, it, the, the challenge with behavior modification is to keep that going. You know, you can't just do that once. You need to kind of do it continually over time. Otherwise, it starts to lose effectiveness. So I think when you can couple both equipment replacement with behavior modification, um, it's really a, a great overall effort and program. And, and quite honestly, you know, from a... Um, you know, sustainability standpoint and, and, and just what we should be doing standpoint, um, we should all become more educated on what we can do and how we can drive impact to this, you know, not only from an institutional standpoint, but, you know, from our own carbon footprint standpoint. So, Sabrina, I'm going to ask you a question just on the same topic about behavior modification. Um, I've been um, involved in this industry for a long time, as you can well know from my age. But um, interesting that Dan points out that you have to do this continuously. From your standpoint, what do you see as a building owner? For Are you doing anything with behavior modification? And if so, how are you sustaining that? Yeah, um, well, we do have outreach um, and, and make programs available to our tenants. Um, but again, it's voluntary. I think from a systematic point of view, we also create opportunities. The, the project that I just shared with you, for instance, we left m many of the DX units that were in the building exactly where they were, but we put VFDs on every piece of equipment, every pump, every fan, everything that, that was available to us, and then connected everything to a state-of-the-art BMS. Um, 
so that we could monitor and then give real-time feedback. And I think when people understand, have a clear understanding of what they're doing and what the implications of that are, they will respond. Um, and that's a large part of the energy efficiency that we realize there, frankly. Hmm, interesting. Kelly, um, you know, in the multifamily world, uh, what opportunities we talked about electrification of domestic hot water. Um, do you see any other pieces of the puzzle that can be uh, used from the, in the multifamily world? Um, so domestic hot water haven't seen yet um, for New York City. Um, definitely have looked into it, um, but haven't seen it in large uh, multifamily buildings yet. Um, so I'll wait to see on that. Um, as far as uh, energy, of, uh, energy efficient technologies, you know, we're looking at the switch right now from um, centralized systems to decentralized systems. So um, talking about if VRF or heat pumps is a good technology to be able to implement in our buildings, um, getting away from through the wall PTAC units to an alternative um, uh, measure. But we're also, look because we have a lot of types of buildings and a lot of different um, distribution systems, we're also learning from each of those buildings of what, what is actually using the, le the least amount of energy. Um, it's very interesting that um, we have seen hydronic buildings, so water source heat pumps and, and, and fan coil buildings, use a significant amount of energy to cool and heat their buildings. And then we look at a steam system with window air conditioning units, and it uses a lot less. Um, and we have to find the right balance for every building because, as was said before, every building is a snowflake. Um, and we need to find the right technology that fits. Um, but unfortunately, with um, decentralized systems, they're super invasive and they are extremely expensive to put in. Um, so I, I'm still uh, you know, ho hoping that we can get to a place where maybe through an energy services agreement, we can put in a technology like that. Um, but it's going to be a little difficult to get there. If you go to decentralization, just to follow up on that for a second, doesn't that also introduce multiple points of failure and maybe the operations and maintenance costs also go up? Well, uh, yes, but you also then have uh, behavioral use reduction as well um, in each of the tenants, because if you're controlling your heating and cooling and you're paying for your heating and cooling, you're going to use less than you may have in the past when your boiler or your central system was cooling on nonstop. Um, and it, it's also a shift of um, understanding who's working on our system. So on a, on a boiler system, you're still going to have a service technician come in. You're still going to have to get repairs that are done. You still have to do your annual maintenance on it. It's just a shift to a different type of technology. And now you're going to have your four quarterlies on, on your um, P pumps, and you're going to change your filters and clean your coils on the indoor unit. So it's just a, a difference. I don't think it's um, going to have a major impact. Interesting. I just want to say a personal note from a behavior modification standpoint. On a January day, I still can't get my wife to um, turn the heat, uh, heat down anymore. It's, uh, it's always warm in our house, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, Dan, you know, uh, we touched on metering on some of the other panels. Um, metering is an important aspect of paying attention to not only what the baseline is, but also uh, where you're headed. Um, you know, Kelly pointed out that she can see various uh, tenants and what their use is. Talk to us a little bit about metering and how important that is in, in, from your perspective. It's a, that's a great question. You know, metering is something that if you have a large portfolio of buildings that can, it can certainly be extremely helpful to know what's going on. Um, you know, if it's important, they say you should measure it, right? And so from a metering standpoint, that's exactly what that is. And if you can, uh, if you can handle the cost of metering in a project from a payback standpoint or return on investment standpoint, I would tell you it's, a, it's, a, it's something that you should definitely include because it becomes very hard to manage to data that you don't know and that you're kind of guessing at. So uh, metering can be extremely important when you're trying to really uh, take your energy use to another level and figure out a way to, uh, to maximize what you're doing with the new facility. So I, it's, it's definitely something you should consider. Uh, interesting. Um, one question for the group. Um, renewables, how do they factor into what your thinking is? Sabrina? I think it's probably ultimately the answer, um, except that the grid is kind of between us today and, and the ultimate answer, but um, something that we look at all the time when we're looking at projects beyond New York City, um, looking at whether or not we can do them in 100% renewable clean. Um, 
something that we have access to at Brookfield through our renewable sector um, and will probably save us in 2030, frankly. <laughs> Good. Any other thoughts on, as we, as we saw from uh, the previous uh, discussion, there was a significant amount of solar put on. Uh, just another note on renewables. When you think of renewables, you, you look at like the, uh, the, the Stytown project that had all the panels on the roof or when you're driving, you know, even out in the country, you see panels on the roof. There are other initiatives for renewables. There are manufacturers now testing a solar panel that would, that would help the efficiency of an air conditioning unit. You know, that it's not plugged into the grid, but it helps the refrigerant and the compressor move things more, uh, more, more effectively. So things like that, the manufacturers are even starting to respond in ways uh, that we're going to see probably in the next three to five years where renewable energy will be seen somewhere you don't expect it. And yeah. just quickly, sure. I think it needs to be part of the capital plan. So mm -hmm. what, you know, this is not, you're not going to be able to do everything at one time. So you're going to have to phase some things in just like um, was done in the example. Um, so I think, yes, a lot of buildings are going to be able to put renewables on site, not every building. Um, but um, keeping that in a large capital um, long-term plan, I think that will be good. But taking care of inefficiencies first is important. <laughs> yeah, and I, and I would agree. You know, just to add to that a little bit from a renewable technology standpoint, you know, over the years when this started to become a discussion point, uh, it, it, when it first started to become a discussion point, it was one of those things you had to really want to do renewable technology. From a costing standpoint or return on investment standpoint, it was a challenge. And, uh, and it's, it's even more of a challenge, depending on where you are in the country and the cost of your utilities and so forth. You know, if you look at a Long Island versus a Buffalo, for example, you know, your costs are certainly much higher down in Long Island, and, and those uh, renewable technologies may make more sense in a place like that. Like I said before, you used to have to really want to do it, but the good news is, I would tell you that the cost of renewable technologies has certainly come down significantly, and with incentives and different things of that nature, it's now becoming more of a reality and it's nice to see that we can start to include more of that in some of these projects. Uh, great. Um, Kelly, you mentioned capital, and I think you did too, Sabrina, and, and funding these programs is always a challenge. Um, I, I want to turn to financing just for a second. So we have a challenge in front of us. How are we going to fund this, and what are the most efficient ways? Um, Sabrina, what are your thoughts on, uh, from a buildings owner's perspective? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think we're really looking for recovery, whether it be through um, our own energy efficiency, would also hope that we have more projects, and we do have two more in, in the works, like the one I showed you, where we're creating value and receiving more rent and therefore paying forward and, and using those funds to, uh, to achieve efficiency in the future and hit 2040 and 2050 goals. Um, I would also hope that we could um, engage the tenant group, of course, and um, see if, if there wasn't resource that way to achieve better efficiency. Um, and, and the rest, frankly, it's um, construction loans right now. There's, there's no equivalent to an opportunity zone, but maybe there should be. Yeah, that's an interesting thought. Uh, Kelly, uh, can you talk about grants and, and other incentives that might be available um, to the building owner? Sure. Um, so yeah, for market rate buildings, you, the Con Edison has an a, a, uh, incentive program that for pretty much any equipment that you're going to have replaced with a more energy efficient option. Um, National Grid has also an um, incentive program on the affordable housing side. Um, NYSERDA has the MPP program. Um, which we have buildings that are still participating in that program. Um, there's also, and I'll give a little plug to uh, NYSERDA on this one, the RTEM program, the Real-Time Energy Management Program. I'm a huge proponent of that. Um, we've kind of talked about data and how data is going to help us get to where we need to go. And NYSERDA's program, whether it be commercial or multifamily, um, is allowing us to do that um, subsidized. So I uh, really push that program. Um, and then as far as um, financing options, you know, the PACE programs was just, you know, through the Climate Mobilization Act is one of the options. It's not going to be a solution for every single building. Um, there's going to have to be a variety of um, 
ways in which we do that, um, hoping that more lenders will come out, um, uh, letting, letting buildings use equipment as collateral um, for it that don't, that don't have any other collateral to use. Um, and then, of course, uh, energy services agreements are going to be um, a big help to pushing a lot of the larger projects forward. And as one of the largest uh, PACE providers uh, nationally, we understand PACE pretty well. I um, think it's an interesting uh, opportunity here for, for New York, especially as it relates to aligning incentives between the building owner and tenants, potentially, where because it's a lien against the building and ultimately a tax, it can be, depending on the lease, uh, applied back to the tenants uh, at some level. So the tenants get the benefit of the energy savings, but they also get the, the pain in some respects of the paying for it. So it uh, nicely aligns the incentives and, and in some ways gets away from, as Tom had pointed out before, he did the um, stairwells uh, and LED lights, and as a result, um, that was only one piece of the puzzle but didn't get to the, uh, the, the, uh, the rest of the equation. I understand there's some uh, audience questions, um, and there's one up here that... Um, how do we get owners to invest in energy efficiency if a retrofit is more expensive than a fine? Well, I guess I'll start with you, uh, Sabrina. How's, how do you feel about that? It's time. It's payback, <laughs> right? So how many, how many years is the payback? And uh, the answer is always um, there is a payback. It's just how long does it take? So um, we do it all the time. And whether it's a three-year payback, an eight-year payback, as long as it's within the life of a lease, it certainly makes sense. Mm -hmm. so. Good. Kelly? I mean, the fines for Local Law 97 are pretty substantial. So um, those 20% those of buildings are, um, if you're using that as your base for the fine associated with it, that it's going to really help a building um, make the push to go with an energy efficient option. Mm. Good. Dan, uh, any thoughts on institutional? Yeah, I, I would tell you that you know, when you look at um, a fine versus uh, the cost, yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a significant cost to replace equipment and, and provide an energy performance contract. Uh, but if you're looking at it purely from a cost standpoint, um, you're probably not seeing the full picture. You need to take a look at the analysis and, and really determine, as you said, what your payback is, you know, what the term of the contract is. Can this be self-supported? Because in, in essence, when, when you look at this sort of a thing, we really try to set the programs up in such a fashion where the energy savings completely pay for the cost of the program in an institutional setting so that there really is no out-of-pocket capital required um, and there is really no, uh, call it upfront capital required uh, at all from the owner. So when you look at it from that perspective, uh, it's, it's, it's going to be less out-of-pocket cost than a fine. I'm going to frame this just a slightly different. Would you take a fine into account in evaluating a project? In other words, there's a fine coming up, so I'm going to avoid the fine and do the project. Would that be something that you? It has to be part of the equation now. You can't, you can't look at it another way now. In the past, we looked at, okay, we're going to replace a boiler. The base cost of that boiler is just the regular, you know, for like replacement, and then anything above that is, you know, the the what the board would have to decide on that difference. Now it's the old equipment plus the fine, and then anything after that. So it's really going to um, help us push, uh, drive it forward. So the, the, the stick will be effective in some respects of motivating to, to move faster. Yeah, when you're getting a million dollar fine, <laughs> um, I think so, every year. Very good. <laughs> Are there any other uh, questions? Okay, well with that, I want to thank the panel. Thank you very much, very in engaging. And I'm going to turn it over to Mike to, uh, to wrap things up. We made it to the end. It's been exciting in more ways than one, and uh, we're thrilled that you were able to join us. Um, let's give another round of applause to all of our panelists today. What a fantastic discussion we've had. Give a shout out again to our sponsors, Tunstall and Carrier. Thank you for making today possible. And to our hosts at NYU uh, for making today exciting for us. From an initiative standpoint, we're going to follow on with two major initiatives that we've already launched. One is on electrification, and you heard that today. Um, we're in the middle of a major convening on that where we'll be pub publishing a report at the beginning of next year on um, the state of the art with electrification and where it can go, particularly in multifamily housing, so stay tuned for that. And then the second initiative that I'm excited that we just launched last week <clears throat> is actually a global initiative. It's Urban Green's first global initiative, but we're, we're partnering with 
Hong Kong, Singapore, Toronto, and London in a five-city evaluation of how carbon trading for buildings or climate efficiency trading for buildings can work. This is the type of international dialogue that we need, but we specifically need it in New York because Local Law 97 requires the city to do a study on carbon trading in just 18 months. And so we're going to lead the way by pulling together all the experts in the buildings community, the trading community, the academic community, to help answer the big questions that will inform that study and move us forward because that's the type of policy initiative we need in New York and that's the type of policy initiative we need around the world uh, to fight climate change. So thank you very much for joining us today. We're thrilled that you were here. We hope you found it worth your time. There's a survey where you can provide your feedback. We react on all that feedback. Everybody have a great afternoon.